This week, we're heading to space for a spot of sun, shade, and a freaky transforming monkey spider bot. We've long fantasized about the possibility of life on other planets. But it was only in 1995 that we actually found the first planet outside of our solar system. These exoplanets are hard to find. Of course they are, they're relatively tiny. And so far they've mainly been detected indirectly, either by the incredibly slight dimming of a star's light as the planet moves in front of it, or by the wobble of the star caused by something orbiting it. In the last 20 years, we've detected about 2,000 exoplanets, but we haven't actually seen many at all. And this is why. Well, the planets are very, very faint compared to the star, and they're very close to the star. The kind of planets where we might find life, uh, an Earth-like planet orbiting a star, will be 10 billion times fainter than the star. But if you can see the planets, you can start to look for evidence of life on their surfaces. What you need is something to block out the light of the star. What you need is a star shade. Due to go into space in the middle of the next decade, it is a crazy sounding thing that can be flown in between a space telescope and a star to precisely block out the star's light and reveal any planets. It'll be a few tens of meters in diameter and in order to block out just the light from that distant star, it'll need to be about 40,000 kilometers away from the telescope. So you manage to block out the starlight you see this tiny dot, which is a planet. What actually will we get from that, that image? What resolution will it be? Will it be a few pixels, or will we see it in great detail? Uh, what we'll see is a dot of light completely unresolved, essentially a single pixel. So that doesn't sound so interesting, but we'll be able to first of all see how far it is from the star, and by revisiting it, we'll be able to see what its orbit is, so we'll know if it's if it's, it might be a planet that could support life due to its separation from the star. But more importantly, we'll be able to take that light and put a spectrometer on it, disperse it, and look for signatures of chemicals on the planet. We'll be able to see water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, perhaps methane, so signs of life, indications that this might be a planet that supports life. And this is not even the maddest part of the scheme. See. There's a problem. The starshade won't fit in a rocket. And that's why a big part of the work being done here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and the beautiful solution that they've come up with is all about fitting the thing into a tight space and then unfurling it once in space. And the inspiration comes from Aragali. It's really quite impressive at the end. You can see how large an area you can fill with such a small uh, volume of material. But this is only the half of it, because then right. you've got the petals that yeah. come out here as well? Yes, yes, exactly. Oh my goodness. This cardboard model is the latest test to make sure the shape can unfurl perfectly when it's all alone up there in the black. The flower shape blocks out the light better than a circle. And those outer petals need to be made to an accuracy of about 50 to 100 microns. You're going to point a telescope at a star, and then you're going to fly this into position to block the light from the star. Correct. What if you then want to look at another star? And the telescope moves by a little yeah. bit, but this well, thing's going to yeah, bounce so it across the galaxy. That's right. So there's actually two ways we could do it. We could move the entire sh shade. So if there's the star over there, and we have 
the star shade and we have the telescope, we can move the star shade to the next target, or you can move the telescope to reposition. And how long would it take to move from? It, it could take anywhere from several days to a week or more, depending on the next target. If I may say, this sounds crazy. <laughs> this sounds like we want to spot some planets. What are we going to do? We're going to put a, a shade in space and we're going to fly it 40,000 kilometers from the telescope. Yes. That sounds insane. Yeah. But what's really cool about that is there's this insane concept of how are you going to fly this massive shade so far away, 40,000 kilometers away from the telescope. But once you start breaking it down into little problems and you start testing and build a pedal, you build a truss, you build a shield, um, you realize piece by piece what engineering needs to go in to that problem to solve it. And so we just break it down into little problems that we can solve in a piecewise um, um, fashion. Yeah, and isn't that a great motto for life? take an impossible problem and break it down into more possible chunks. I love the fact that at JPL you can just wander into a random room and it's called something like the Extreme Terrain Mobility Lab. That's what they're doing here, they're making robots to cope with extreme terrain. This is Axel, which is a robot that's a pair of wheels that can be lowered down cliffs. And this is Fido and Athena. These are the prototypes for the Mars rovers Spirit an opportunity. And of course the point about robots is they can do things that humans might want to do but in places that humans can't go. Now all of these have fairly familiar designs, wheels here, some robots of course have legs, but Kate Russell has found one that looks like nothing I have ever seen before. In 2012, the world watched with bated breath as NASA deployed a rover on the surface of Mars using a sky crane. This kind of science is incredibly expensive. The rover weighed 900 kilograms, as much as a full-grown giraffe. But the equipment required to land it gently had to be able to take the weight of 32 giraffes. Total cost? $2.5 billion. It would have been much cheaper if Curiosity was lightweight, came flat-packed, and was sturdy enough just to be dropped on the red planet's surface. Meet Superball, a tensegrity robot in development to NASA Ames. This lightweight, sphere-like matrix can be packed down flat, taking up minimal space in a rocket and vastly reducing launch costs. Because of the unique structure of this robot and the fact that it can deform and reform itself and take massive impacts, eventually NASA will be able to literally throw it at the surface of a planet and its scientific payload in the middle will be protected. It's bouncy. Once deployed, Superball can handle much rougher terrains than a rover, rolling right over obstacles and up and down hills. Tendon wires connecting the struts spool in and out to create momentum, in much the same way as flexing your muscles moves your limbs. If it bumps into anything solid, it'll just bounce back. It should even be able to survive falling off a cliff. The next step for Super Bowl is to redesign the robot such that it can actually survive at least a one-story drop. You can expect to see a, a system like this on an actual NASA mission probably 15 to 20 years from now. Over at JPL, they're working on limbed robots. It's research spawned from the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where teams competed to create highly mobile and dexterous robots that can move, explore, and build things without human intervention. One of the great things about the simian body plan, right, is that all of our limbs can be used for either mobility or manipulation. And so if we're putting things together, you can certainly imagine hanging on with a couple of them and doing the manipulation to actually assemble things together with the others. And that makes for a very robust uh, way of putting things together in an environment like zero-g where you just don't want to float off. The plan for King Louis is to be sent into space to build stuff with visual codes a bit like QR codes to guide it. We have a structured environment. We know what we're putting together. And so we actually put signposts on all of the bits and pieces of the structure we're putting together that actually tell the robot a few things. Uh, most importantly, it actually helps the robot figure out where those things that it's manipulating are in space, literally and figuratively, so that it can uh, align itself better. The 
codes will also include construction information, like which bits go together and how much torque to apply to a bolt. This will allow robots to work autonomously in teams, building space stations or planetary habitats faster and more economically than previously possible. But NASA hasn't completely given up on our four-wheeled space helpers. Here, uh, we try to develop new kinds of robots for future space exploration. Uh, this robot, for example, is called K-REX. It's one of our main research robots that we uh, develop and we test here in the roverscape at NASA Ames. Um, this is a large uh, you know, play area for robots, uh, a proving ground that we use to really try to develop things like uh, navigation um, or do mission simulations. One of the biggest problems with space travel is getting stuff off our planet. It requires an incredible amount of fuel to break through the atmosphere. So K-REX's current job is looking at ways to collect useful resources once we're already out in space. Can we go to the moon, uh, find water, and use that for oxygen and for hydrogen to make fuel, and then go other places uh, beyond the moon? What For you, what's the most exciting sort of new development that's on the horizon? For a long time now, we've had robots do exploration. Uh, we have rovers on Mars that are still functioning today. We have humans in space uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, and in the future, what we're going to see, I think, more of is really human robot teams. Uh, robots might be working ahead of humans. They might be working following up after humans. They could be working side by side or maybe just in support of humans. But in any case, what we're going to have is a future of humans and robots really working together. So biggest question perhaps of the day for me, can I drive K-Rex? Definitely. Let's, let's have you do that. Yes. Now, lots of you think we click reporters have the best jobs in the world. But after spending a day at the Roverscape testing ground, I think there's another contender for that title. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that in the US, after much speculation, Facebook head honcho Mark Zuckerberg denied he wants to run for President of the United States. Not everybody wants to run the world, it seems, just the bits related to social media. Plus, help could be at hand for forgetful Apple AirPod owners. Apple has created a Find AirPods feature for its wireless earbuds. It works in the same way as the Find My Phone feature. No word yet, though, on how much rummaging down the back of the sofa it'll lead to. Plus, authorities in Dubai showed off a new way of fighting fires. All with the help of a jet ski for traffic avoiding rapid response and jet pack for some elevated extinguishing. Water pressure keeps the firefighter airborne, allowing them to target difficult to reach fires near waterways and then hose them down. Next, never get off the boat. Legendary movie director Francis Ford Coppola has thrown his support behind a video game version of his Vietnam War epic Apocalypse Now. It's going to be survival horror and is being financed via crowdfunding. And finally, fashion conscious astronauts have had to make do with any colour spacesuit they like, as long as it's in white. Not anymore. NASA and Boeing have revealed details of a new upgraded blue spacesuit. These are lighter and easier to move in. Personally, I prefer pinstripe. Up on the International Space Station, resources are pretty tight. But while food and water do need to be delivered as takeout, you might think that power, at least, might be plentiful. But over their lifetime, the International Space Station's solar arrays degrade and produce less power. And as our space aspirations grow, we could do with more and more power anyway, from bigger and bigger panels. Now that's a bit of a problem. To give you an idea about how much power the ISS needs, it has eight solar arrays. Each one is as long and as tall as this room. To fit something this huge into a rocket's payload, as we discovered with the Starshade, you have to fold it up. The problem here is that each part of the solar array is mounted on a thick, protective aluminium backing. The more you fold it to reduce the length, 
the more you increase the thickness. But here at Lockheed Martin in Palo Alto, Wahid Azizpour is working on a solution. I'm constantly surprised by anything that goes into space about how light it is. I mean, it looks, it has it looks to quite be. thick, but yeah, it's so light. It has light. to be. Yep. I mean, it costs a lot of money to launch one of these one pounds in space, so it has to be light. And but why right. did you need that, that kind to, of honeycomb? To make sure that the cells do not crack when you're launching in space. It's really violent when it goes in, in space in the, on a rocket itself. So, so it's not it's, when it's in space, it's actually the launching and then launching, I guess the unfurling that, yeah, that could yeah, damage these that, things. That could damage the cells itself. So. But, but this is not good enough for you. Um, <laughs> this is the thickness of a normal solar array and, and you're now making them that Putting thick. them on that. It's a substance called Kapton and it will replace that thick aluminium support. It feels like, um, it just feels like a bit of plastic. So what does this mean for stuff that goes into space now, whether it's space travel or satellites or anything like that? What, what does this mean? You can put a lot more of power, uh, a lot more cells in space in a small area itself. So you don't need all of these things. All you can put is in the captain. So if you want double the power, all you need to do is double the amount of um, that material capped on it, which adds another inch to it, and it doubles the amount of power you need. So. Only a few of us will, of course, ever get into space, but for the next best thing, why not try it in VR? Here's Laura Lewington. I've had some really engaging virtual reality experiences, one of them simply set in an office, but it seems that if you're entering a VR world, you might as well go somewhere really exciting, like space. That's where home of VR Spacewalk takes you. Inspired by NASA's training programme, it aims to bring a mission in space to the masses. After getting used to your new surroundings, you undertake an emergency mission. Whilst enjoying views of Earth from afar, a friendly hand from a fellow astronaut helps to get you on your way. Ah, oh, I, can, I can hold a hand. I feel a strange sense of safety there's another astronaut here. The BBC commissioned the experience last year as its first steps into the world of virtual reality content. We've taken all the storytelling power of the BBC and applied that behind it, so there's a great script, there's a great narrative. Um, and then we've also looked at all the kind of cutting-edge um, uh, explorations that people are doing around VR in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of biomonitoring, um, haptic feedback, etc, etc, and trying to bring that into it, just as a massive piece of learning, really. My preview here on the HTC Vive saw it set up along with a chair providing haptic feedback and a heart rate monitor, which resulted in my being sent back to base if readings went too high. But apparently I'm very calm in space. In March it'll be released for Vive on Steam as well as Oculus. Wow, this is incredible. I'm now looking at Vancouver apparently. Some artistic licence was of course needed, like making tasks shorter so they wouldn't get boring. But aside from creating the pictures and storytelling a project as bold as this needs, there were the usual challenges faced by those producing VR content. In 360 video and virtual reality, locomotion is one of the biggest problems. Uh, if you move someone without them having made a conscious decision to be moved, it can be very disorientating and incur motion or sim sickness. Uh, so to help get around those problems in this uh, particular environment of zero gravity on the outside of the space station, we built uh, a system where you move yourself by grabbing handles. So every single movement of yourself within the environment is always user initiated and as granular, as slow or as fast as you are comfortable with. Oh, oh goodness, I feel most disorientated. Wow, the depth of it I think was the thing that was really surprising. You really got a sense of being up high, seeing things really, really far away. It took a while to actually get to grips with what I was meant to be doing, but I think just the fact that I was moving around within space was quite incredible. Whilst it wasn't possible to create a sense of weightlessness, the pictures were amazing, but obviously I can't vouch for how true to life they are. It is essential to life on Earth. 
But the sun is a fearsome beast and cares not one jot for the way that we've chosen to live. Seen up close, this seemingly uniform sphere of light reveals itself as a churning, raging ball of fire. Every so often, the surface erupts, flinging huge amounts of particles into space in a phenomenon known as a coronal mass ejection. So this is a coronal mass ejection in close-up. And this is what astrophysics does. This is how we figure out what, what kind of gases are in there, how fast they move, how hot they are, how dense they are. Have we ever been hit by one of those? Earth has been yeah. hit by one of those, yeah, many okay. times. Many times. Every so 11 that's not, years. That's not game over when we're hit by something. No, no, no. It no, looks no. Quite, it's, quite final to me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's huge. I mean, the Earth is about you know, this size here. Right. Um, <laughs> now, we get hit fairly regularly. Every 11 years, the sun goes through a, a cycle where the sun's magnetic field gets very active, and then we get a lot of these. This is what we call space weather. Which, I guess, makes Bart de Pontieu a space weatherman. He's in charge of IRIS, a satellite launched three years ago which looks at small parts of the sun in great detail. His job is to use what he sees to create solar supercomputer simulations, which may unlock its mysteries and help us to understand whether particular coronal mass ejections will affect us here on Earth. You can actually see in this movie, when that eruption happens, you see all that snow on the image. Mm. Those are the energetic particles of the sun that hit our detectors, our CCDs, okay. and they leave charges in there. And these energetic particles impact not just the CCDs, but they can impact also the computers on board satellites. And that means that the satellites can, can flip a bit, essentially, and then screw up the, the whole um, operation of the satellite. And satellites have gotten lost as a result. And so when, when these things happen, you can go in safe mode before. If you can predict them properly, you can go in safe mode. Many of these storms can affect, can be geo-effective and, and change the environment around Earth. They can lead to power grids getting overloaded and transformers blowing up. And so you could, you could actually cycle down the usage on your power uh, grid if you knew that something like this was happening. Or you could tell your troops that your satellite communications might be disturbed because the ionosphere is disturbed that day. IRIS isn't the only space telescope to come out of Lockheed Martin here in California. A new one was launched in 2016, and before the launch, we got a sneak preview of how they were testing it using this. Welcome to the Heliostat. Now, the point of this thing is to bring what's up there down into the labs below. So if I lean down this tube, you can see me. Hello there. Of course, you don't really want to see me or just the blue sky, what you actually want to see is... Down here, the sun's image is bounced around and fired into the clean room containing the new satellites, which are so small, they can fit four of them into a relatively tiny space. The next generation of solar monitoring telescope is that thing there. The Solar Ultraviolet Imager, SUVI, will watch the sun in extreme ultraviolet. It should be able to provide early warnings of heavy space weather caused by solar flares and coronal mass ejections, and will ultimately help us to unlock the secrets of our nearest star, something that is no longer just for scientific interest, but will protect a society that is increasingly dependent on technology too. This is an example of, of one of these simulations from the University of Oslo in Norway. Um, is that sexy? Where <laughs> we really need these models to understand what we're seeing and, and how we could possibly predict things like this. Tell me you've got that as your desktop wallpaper. <laughs> because I want a copy of that. Uh, I do. 